Hi, and welcome to the June 2021 edition of the CNCF End User Technology Radar. I'm really pleased to have with me today the Radar team, who's featuring representatives from Fidelity, Mattermost, and Meltwater. And today we're going to look at the technology radar that they've put together. So let's go from the beginning. So my name is Cheryl Hung and I lead the CNCF end user community. You can find me on the internet at Oi Cheryl. And the CNCF end user community is a group of more than 140 companies featuring some of the biggest and smallest companies out there who are all using cloud native and Kubernetes. And the goal of the CNCF technology radar is to find out what is the ground truth, what is the reality of cloud native as it looks today. So the CNCF technology radar typically looks like this. We have three rings, adopt, trial and assess. And we're going to look at a specific topic which the radar team has chosen and look at a few different tools and frameworks within those, that topic and place them into each of these three levels. So adopt means clear recommendation. Many companies and many teams have used it successfully. Trial means that we've used it with success and recommend a closer look. And assess means you tried it out, it seems promising and you should take a closer look at this when you find this need. I'd like to welcome members of our radar team now and ask them to introduce themselves. So we're just going to go left to right. So Gabe, please go ahead. Hi there, I'm Gabe Jackson. I work at Mattermost on the cloud platform team. Um, even though Mattermost has uh, a history of developing a communications platform that's on-premise focused, recently we've been uh, also delivering it as a service in the cloud. So that's what my team is responsible for. Awesome, Federico. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Federico Hernandez. I am a principal engineer at Meltwater, being part of the teams in the uh, engineering enablement mission, helping other development teams at Meltwater to work efficiently with their mission, providing the uh, base platforms for them to deploy their applications to. Fantastic. And my colleague, uh, Simona, is uh, unfortunately not able to, to join us today, but he was part of uh, the radar team contributing with uh, content ideas and uh, his expertise. Yep, definitely. All right, let's go next to Rajan. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Hello everyone. Um, my, my name is Raj Rajan. People call me Rajan. Uh, I'm a VP at Fidelity Investments. Uh, my focus is mainly cloud platform architecture. Uh, we, we are responsible for building uh, uh, next-gen platform, cloud-native platform uh, for Fidelity where application teams, development teams reap the benefits of uh, the latest cloud-native technologies without uh, you know, putting much effort into it. So we, want, we try to make it uh, easy for them. Uh, currently, we are at like 250 to 300 clusters in that range. Uh, we are managing that. So that's me. Awesome. And Niraj, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Yeah, Niraj Amin, uh, also work at Fidelity, uh, leading the cloud platforms teams, um, primarily focused on um, the CSPs uh, and, and the journey that Fidelity has taken to, to migrate um, applications to the cloud, uh, specifically on um, uh, the Kubernetes platforms uh, that we're building out and architecting. <laughs> Fantastic. And I want to thank you all for giving up your time both today and over the last few weeks to put this together and contributing your expertise back to the larger community. So first question, um, as you probably seen, we chose multi-cluster management for the topic of this radar. So why is multi-cluster management something that's interesting to you right now? Uh, yeah, I can, I can start with it. Um, so I think this is one topic where um, it, it really depends on whether you're a small team, uh, you know, it's a small organization or we have a like lot, lot of application developers in a lot of large organizations. Those sort of things really affect uh, your choice, uh, your, your choice of how you would like to manage it. So, um, and this is one of the areas where there are like 
several number of options available, uh, but there is no clear choice typically as to like which one is like the better one, right? Um, so uh, typically, I think the uh, this is one of the topics where based on the results, you will really find it useful that if you're doing something today in a certain way to manage clusters, uh, you would, you would, you'd get the reassurance that, you know, others are also doing it in a certain way. And if not, you get to know the reasons why, you know, that's not the case. So uh, it's, it's really interesting and very, uh, you know, important topic because everything starts with the, you know, cluster creation and provisioning, right? So, um, yeah, so that's me. Cool. Anyone else have thoughts about multi-cluster, perhaps what they're doing right now? Multi-cluster management? Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, regarding the topic itself, I think one of the things that maybe caught uh, most of us sort of off guard, or at least me, was uh, there was sort of the idea of um, some of the other things we had discussed as possible topics. There was sort of like a clear cut sort of top three or top five sort of uh, options. But when this topic was brought up, there was a lot of organic conversation immediately, a lot of people doing a lot of different things. And so it was like a perfect thing to sort of dive into. Um, yeah, and uh, we have the same idea at Mattermost of we use a bunch of different tools to do different things. Uh, and depending on sort of our needs at the time, we'll, we'll pick a totally different tool set. So um, yeah, that all ties into the topic. There's also, um, as everyone starts with one cluster there and then expands and the journey continues, and, and, and you, you, you grew your environment into, into large environments. There is no clear path out there. And it, this is like an interesting journey and to, to document for, for, for teams starting out, okay, I'm now here. I will probably end up with a large environment. What possibilities are there? What are others doing and learn from that to avoid um, the, the pain that a lot of us have experienced and uh, not longer experienced, maybe. <laughs> I'll just add, and I kind of agree with Federico, I think that scalability um, uh, concerns around uh, trying to figure this out and, and picking this topic, I think is good. I think um, clusters themselves, right, are, are becoming um, more like kettle, right? Uh, more and more. Um, and and as, as we grow and more, especially at Fidelity, as more teams adopt, move over uh, to Kubernetes. I think um, for a platform team that's sort of centrally trying to manage this, I, I think um, this topic is pretty important. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so after picking the topic, um, we basically went out and asked the end user community, what are your thoughts on this? What are you doing right now? What things do you not use? Have you moved away from? And just to give you an idea of the different kinds of companies that responded, um, we've got some of the companies listed here. Um, most companies kind of fell into sort of generic software industries, which can cover a lot of different things. But I think there was a slight bias towards the larger, larger companies, which perhaps makes sense. If you're talking about multi-cluster management, you're more likely to need it if you have a larger company and more complex infrastructure. So at this point, what did you expect in terms of results? I can kick that off. Um, the funny thing is I didn't know what to expect. Uh, on one hand, I kind of expected that there'd be a lot of varying answers. Um, I assume that as the number of employees at the organization sort of skewed towards the higher end, as in there's more there, that they would sort of have a more clear tool set and infrastructure stack. Um, but it turned out that that wasn't necessarily the case. I was expecting maybe there to be some sort of like hidden gems of like, this is a way you could do it that maybe we weren't expecting. Um, but yeah, the I, I was when this topic initially came up, sort of was in a camp of thinking that perhaps Mattermost was doing it in a unique and maybe not completely optimal way. And I was definitely pleasantly surprised to see that uh, it, there wasn't necessarily the case that a lot of people were using a lot of different tools and that this is a definitely an interesting problem that's still being tackled. 
Yeah, I want to. I want to add to that. Um, so I, I think I, I I get the feeling. So we we started with over a period of two years. I think I still remember uh, creating the first cluster. So we we started with like one cluster, and then now we are at like two two fifty to three hundred clusters. So in the journey, like many times, uh, you know, we have, we have felt the same thing. Where are we doing things in the right way? Because uh, we have to sort of do some custom things. Like we have to do things in a slightly different way, uh, especially the scaling part. So um, uh, I'm pretty, I, I clearly remember that the first six months we were only at 10 clusters or something like that. So we we're doing a lot of experiments. We are making sure uh, this, the stability aspects and all those things are there. And then we quickly scaled, right? So at that time we had to do things in a slightly different way. So uh, many times we did feel the same thing where are we in the right track? Uh, is it okay to do things that way? But yeah, looking at the results, I think uh, it's definitely reassuring. Federico, I think you are mute. Yes, sorry. Um, uh, what I expected to learn was, or was uh, curious about, is that since the end user community is uh, spread over a uh, variety of industries with all different uh, requirements, different policies, different uh, rule sets, um, to see if there is like a a, a pattern emerging if you're in this industry you 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 manage your your environments like with this and if you're in this industry you you will manage with this and um and, and so i was expecting perhaps to to discover some patterns there or some also as gabe said um hidden gems that uh, that are non not really known but uh would be good to 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 give them a, a larger platform to to become no, um, known in the in the community yeah and no, i'll add the same i mean um i, I thought when going into this i thought there would be some conformity across um uh some of these uh these toolings um so th that was my expectation or, or opinion going into this um so it, it was interesting to see the results <clears throat> Um, actually, I, I'll follow up with a question of my own um, too, Gabe, since you mentioned hidden gems. Why do you think that there aren't really those hidden gems? Why do you think everybody has deployed it in kind of separate and unique ways? It's a good question. Um, just going with my gut on this one, I think it's just because it's a hard problem. Um, Kubernetes, as was discussed earlier, you know, was... We've solved with the Kubernetes platform, the idea of running apps and services as sort of cattle, right? But we're now at the point where the clusters themselves need to go through that same uplift. And I think that it was just something that wasn't initially tackled in the same way as the core platform was. And it's in certain ways, even more complex than, than the Kubernetes platform itself. So I, if I had to guess, it's just that, that um, it's just the next logical step. So that's where we're working towards. And also it's a really hard problem to tackle. Okay, we'll dive more into the into the themes of it in a little bit. But first of all, let us take a look at the results. So the first thing to note on this is we actually have two radars this time, not just one. And these were split between cluster deployment and core services and add-ons. So first question to the radar team, why do we have two radars and not one as usual? Yeah, I'll start on this one. So uh, I, I think it kind of just evolves. Um, I, don't, I don't think any of us were expecting to kind of go into um, uh, having two radars at the end of the day. But as we as we went through the, the questions and, you know, the radar itself, I think we started um, uh, figuring out that we had two different um, uh, radars that would be required. One that would handle sort of the infrastructure piece or the cluster deployment aspect of it. And then another one that, um, uh, tooling wise would, would answer um, what you do almost in day two or kind of build on top uh, once the infrastructure provisioning or, or you know, um, day two operations of the cluster itself uh, outside of the infrastructure, uh, we're done. <clears throat> so I, I think it was an evolution over, uh, as we kind of dug into to solving or answering this question. <clears throat> and there's some other interesting things I see here as well. So for instance, private cloud managed Kubernetes and public cloud managed Kubernetes. So would someone like to talk about why these are grouped in these ways and maybe what, I think public, public cloud managed Kubernetes is maybe 
understandable people knows know what that means but what is private cloud managed kubernetes what kind of things fell into that yeah well can take that so what we have seen is that um organizations with a uh, with a smaller amount of clusters um depend on on the the the, the regular installers like cops uh give adf and 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 others um we've seen that um the when the number of cluster grows there's a tendency to move away from these installers and to use managed uh kubernetes services for organizations in 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 the in the public cloud that would be the um offerings from the uh public cloud providers for organizations then in in the uh with their own data centers not being in the in the in in the cloud even those then tend to to use um packaged kubernetes offerings that um would be ma a managed Kubernetes offering and resembles the ones that you would expect and see from from the from the public cloud. So the pattern there is um, either you're in the cloud or in your data centers. The more uh, clusters that you manage, there's a tendency to move over to to manage uh, Kubernetes offerings. And Anyone? another aspect that I saw here in, in these results is that we uh, compared also to the other ra radars is um, that we have um, the adopt sector pretty much filled while the other um, sectors are um, a little bit empty compared to, to the other radars. And uh, during our discussions, we, we, we said that this, um, if you're operating Kubernetes and if you're um, in production with Kubernetes, you have found your your tool set and um, you will then stick to that one and continue to work that with that one rather than experimenting a lot and switching a lot of these things out so it's either you're in the adopt phase and using those and perhaps you then look from time to time into the into the part of assess yeah, and just to add to that, I think um, in respect to whether it is private or public, I think the key word there is managed. Um, so as the number of clusters increase, like the one way to look at it is like as the number of clusters increase, your, uh, the complexity of managing control plane components, uh, HCD and stuff like that, uh, it's going to be tricky. That's that's one aspect. But, but the other aspect, at least from the fidelity side, uh, what we looked at was uh, we wanted to spend that time instead on that, like spend on uh, other stuff where we add like a lot of lot more features that will you know benefit uh, the the application teams. Uh, you know, they'll, things that will make it really easy for them uh, to consume the technology. So we we sort of chose a strategy to focus that time on those things. Uh, you know, so that you know things get better and easy for the app teams to sort of use the technology. So. Yeah, and, for sure. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, regarding the the radar itself and the fact that there's a lot of tools uh, in Adopt, um, we actually really challenged ourselves to on those assumptions of do these all need to be in Adopt and why are there so many? And I think it actually is a good way to visualize just um, like how tricky this this problem still is, this cluster management uh, issue, uh, and. Um, I think over time we'll see other things change, but right now you can see that it, it was almost in a way sort of a forced adoption where you have all these tools and they, they help you in a very specific way, sometimes in a couple of ways, but you can't really get the whole um, issue taken care of with just like one or two tools. And then maybe you're you know assessing another three or four, you sort of were pushed into a spot where you needed a lot of them. And that's why I think a lot of them ended up in the adopt circle. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think both of these radars have uh, in the adopt uh, section, um, you know, custom in-house tools. So I think that kind of ties back to our earlier point where um, we don't, there isn't a clear cut winner yet. Um, so I think folks are trying to bridge that gap um, where possible or where needed. Yeah, and to give a little bit more details on that. So 
in the answers that we have seen is even for um, organizations choosing the, the, the managed Kubernetes offerings, there were like a hundred percent overlap to, um, to custom in-house tools. So while you're still um, using and trying to, to get the benefits out of a managed service, it's, it's not enough. The managed service does only provide so much that you need to uh, complement it with custom in-house tools that um, help you to, to do the, the, the work and the, and the setup that is needed for your own organization. Awesome. Um, this is really great commentary. Um, I just want to move on now to the specific themes that we pulled out of this and look into those in a little bit more detail. So the first theme was there is no silver bullet for multi-cluster management. Yeah, this can be summarized as Gabe said, this, um, while there are these tools, um, there is no clear winner and you need to have um, a combination of tools to do the, the setup that is required for your environment. As well as with the, as I said, just uh, a couple of minutes before, with the managed Kubernetes service, they they cannot or they are not giving you the silver bullet. You need to complement this with with extra tools or with extra custom in-house developed tools to do that to um, overcome the, the the lacking features, the lacking possibilities of what is out there. The other thing is also since there are so many tools required for this is that um, it feels like that you need to come with your own glue to put these things together so that they stick together and work together. Yeah, I saw a lot of nodding heads there with um, you need to glue everything together. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think going back to the idea of the hidden gem, it, I, I think it basically ties directly to this point. So we were all sort of hoping maybe there's a silver bullet out there or something that's at least a little bit closer to that, that we could all start using. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think we necessarily saw that pop up, but I definitely agree that the one of the common themes was that glue, as was mentioned, it's a really good point. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of this, you know, and this is kind of where I think it, it matters for this, maybe the sector or the industry you're in or, or, or the company in, uh, that has certain rule sets, et cetera, right? So at Fidelity, um, you know, we have lots of regulations and security concerns. So part of that, part of the glue um, is, is to handle some of these. Um, I know different companies have different hierarchies of, of how they set up uh, accounts or subscriptions, right, um, et cetera. So all that kind of ties back to um, uh, needing some custom tooling or glue that they, they kind of mesh a um, uh, couple of tool, toolkits together. Cool. Okay, let's go on to the next topic, which you've discussed a little bit already. Cluster management often requires custom house, uh, custom built in-house solutions. Maybe um, I'd like to know a little bit more about like what, what are those solutions? Like what yeah, are I you building for? Yeah, I can I can probably start with that. So uh, yeah, typically, right? So uh, when the problem statement is clearly defined, uh, though you start up with number of tools, then over a period of time you'll 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 see clear winners. But in this case, I think the the problem statement itself stretches a little bit here and there, depending on the company policies and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll give you some example. Um, so for example, some sort of companies might take an approach where uh, the, the app teams might actually go uh, get the cluster and then they sort of manage it from there. So they just go to the central team just to get the cluster provision. Uh, you have the other set of, uh, you know, uh, teams where they want the central team to manage the entire platform. For example, in Fidelity, right? The reason to have the custom, um, you know, so in, uh, solutions. So uh, we sort of took an approach where uh, instead of looking at clusters separately, add-ons uh, and the features that you add on it, uh, that separately, we sort of uh, decided to look at it as like one platform. So what I mean by that is from, from an application teams or development team standpoint, they, they look at like one platform version. They say, hey, uh, 
Fidelity platform version 1.0. And that behind the scenes could be like one, one 18 Kubernetes cluster, uh, a set of add, a specific version of add-ons, a specific set of uh, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure setup and stuff like that. So if you want to put all these things to, together, uh, you, you sort of go down the GitOps ops route and stuff like that. So we, in our case, we sort of came up with like a custom solution where teams can just go and describe what they need and like plain YAML files. And behind the scenes, like uh, we use like a lot of other, a uh, lot of these tools behind the scenes work together to make that happen. So that is one example. The other one is uh, we sort of decided to take the infrastructure uh, setup sort of into account. For example, uh, one of the tools that we built uh, along with the cluster portion, it sort of does the infrastructure setup. Like it, it, it executes the cloud formation templates and stuff like that. But the main point here is the, the versioning is like map. So this particular uh, set of cl the cluster provisioning works with these set of uh, cloud set of cloud formation templates, right? The, the specific way you set up VPCs and stuff like that, everything is like version control. I'll give you another example, which we have done. It's, it's an open source tool from our side. Uh, we, we, wanted an, we wanted a tool where uh, developers can simply plug in their Active Directory credentials. All they, they have an identity, which is the Active Directory credentials. Simply by plugging in, we want them to, uh, get access to the cluster. So uh, in our case, we have a tool called K-Connect. Uh, so developers sort of plug in their AD credentials and then it automatically behind the scenes goes and figures out based on their credentials, what sort of clusters they have access, uh, they have to clusters across clouds. So it'll automatically uh, list, hey, you have access in five clusters in AWS, two clusters in Azure and like five clusters in Rancher. And they just select one and then behind the scenes, it it's wires the connection. So they don't have to manage Coop config, you know, and stuff like that. So this, 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 this might be trivial if you have like a five member team, but when you're talking about like 10,000 developers in an organization, even small things like this makes like significant values, right? Um, so uh, yeah, these are some of the examples where you still need like custom build, you know, you know, solutions. Uh, I don't know if others want to add. Uh, at Mattermost, we had to develop a tool um, to basically allow us to scale our sort of custom clusters. So we, for the majority of our workloads, decided not to use um, a managed solution. Uh, and we used COPS, which is fairly flexible. But uh, if you're not familiar, COPS allows you to just sort of pick a, a public cloud and deploy a uh, Kubernetes cluster there. Um, but one of the things that is sort of um, inherent with COPS is that you just run these commands and you manage it that way. And we needed to scale. So we need to build a bunch of clusters. We needed to upgrade them and manage them possibly in parallel. So we, we developed this thing we call the cloud provisioner. And yeah, it, it was our custom tool and our way around this problem of how do we sort of like retain control? You know, we, we can choose our Kubernetes version and like we have access to the master nodes and some of these things you have to give up if you do it with a managed solution. So how do we keep all of that? And that was that was where the glue came in. We had to, to sort of build this tool to do that. And, you know, it, it works fairly well, it allows you to scale, but um, it just shows you like the tools need help to kind of get them to a spot where maybe they're as useful as they could possibly be. Cool. All right, let's go on to the next one. All right, common tool combinations include Helm with operators and GitOps with Argo slash Flux. I think Niraj, do you want to start on this? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think this goes back to the second radar, right? Um, so at, at a certain point in time, um, at least at Fidelity, once the infrastructure piece and the cluster's there, um, we augment um, the cluster with um, as part of the platform with the with a bunch of stuff. Um, first and foremost comes um, certain security and, and RBAC that we apply. Um, then there's other other operators that we've custom built. Um, there's you know uh, ingress controllers in terms of um, uh, how to you know get connectivity into a cluster, et cetera, et cetera. So um, all these things um, from a uh, post provisioning or post um, day two action on the cluster itself, the infrastructure piece of it. Um, we actually handle today with um, uh, a GitOps and, and use Flux. So, um, you know, we have uh, certain repos, um, you know, uh, at Fidelity that manage uh, based off versioning of, of, of platforms that will then um, you, you make use of, of Flux and Helm to, um, you know, uh, uh, push uh, basically a, a set of um, 
add-ons to a cluster and, and get it to a proper state. So th this makes use of um, the Kubernetes um, you know, declarative uh, fashion uh, and really works well for us and at scale. <clears throat> Gabe or Federico, is GitHub yeah, something that you use? We use it perhaps partly, not directly with our Argon and Flux. But um, what I also uh, wanted to mention is from the answers there is like, where you have seen is on the cluster provisioning uh, part, organizations tending to use um, the, 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 the managed Kubernetes and then um, gluing it together with their custom uh, in-house tools this even goes on to the to the um, day two services, to the core services, to the add-ons. A naked cluster cannot be used by any organizations. Um, there's no observability that needs to be added on our back um, ingress, and 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 those instead of being that the managed Kubernetes there, you will see that um, organizations use the 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 project provided helm charts, but that is not enough again. Um, you glue those together with custom in-house tools, which could be in most cases than the operators. So um, the, the same problem for provisioning the cluster exists then on the, on the, on the other side of the core services and add-ons. Um, they need to be combined. They need to be adapted to the um, requirements of the organizations using them. And there is no no standard way of, of, of really doing it unless you see the um, operator pattern be becoming a standard. But there are so many operators and there's also in, in, in so many ways configured differently. This is a good point to jump to the fourth one, which mentions operators. So we did see operators as quite popular. A lot of people voted for adopt, place them in adopt. Um, so what do you think? Why have operators become so successful? Yeah, maybe I'll start off with an example. It's an interesting example. And then I, I think Neeraj can follow, follow up with that. So uh, we had a requirement um, where teams had to do exec into pods in production. So typically it's not allowed, uh, at least in our case, uh, but we had some really interesting use cases which basically warranted for that. So um, it was very difficult thing to, because typically when you when you do an exec, then it's, it's uh, the, the connection stays forever and stuff like that. It's, it's a tricky problem. So one of the ways we solved it is we sort of have an operator in our platform, which is there in like all the clusters uh, where teams can actually go and uh, request an exec pass. So basically they, they just submit like a YAML file, which is like kind of exec pass. And they say, I need like one, like few minutes of like exec uh, access or stuff like that. And then behind the scenes, an operator actually gives the uh, exec ac access to the specific team and then takes it away, uh, you know, after like certain number of minutes. So uh, without operator, achieving something like this, it's going to be really, really tricky. We did think about having an API first where they call, but the moment you have an API, you have the authentication authorization thing that you need to take care of. Uh, but with operator, we can easily tie into the uh, RBAC model, uh, Kubernetes RBAC model. So if somebody can submit a request for exec pass, which is like the kind YAML file, the exec pass YAML file, then we know that uh, Kubernetes has you know allowed, uh, uh, um, allowed them to create it you know, it has gone through the Kubernetes ad bag. So we can tie into that. So uh, I, I felt I sort of wanted to start off with an example so that it becomes much more clearer. I don't know, Neeraj, if you want to add something to it. Yeah, no, I would just say, I mean, I, I think um, we have, uh, that's the one example. I think we have uh, have at least four or five operators that we've built in-house. I think we've open sourced one of them. Um, I, I think operators are, are, are kind of uh, the standard way to automate and kind of target concise, uh, tasks, right, to complete within a cluster. Um, so I, I think um, I see, uh, I mean, in, from, a, from a community perspective, I think um, almost everything uh, or almost um, all the new, new things, at least, all have operators associated with them. Um, I, I've seen stuff from Mongo, Kafka, et cetera, right? So operators really make it easy to um, uh, and mask some of the complexity that normally would, would, would appear, all right? So instead of having to uh, maintain or manage an entire Kafka cluster, um, you can have an operator that really constructs um, the cluster itself for you. Um, so I, I think um, 
uh, we've also, I think to Rajan's earlier point, use operators to um, uh, facilitate some of, um, of the work within a cluster. So we have tiers of, of, of authority within a cluster. So there might be a, a, a business unit cluster administrator that may be able to do certain things, um, whereas um, uh, normal, uh, like a, a namespace admin cannot. So um, tying our back to, to operators is really easy. Um, and, and with, with uh, custom resources, et cetera, I, I think it's extremely extensible. So I think that's really beneficial for us. Cool, and you made a good point there about custom or in-house operators versus the operators that are available widely. I don't think we distinguish them um, on the radar itself, but that's something to look out for as well. Yeah, the, um, during our discussion, it was mentioned also like the operator is the, the resident expert that lives in, for that piece of software that lives in the cluster. And you can talk to that resident expert, the operator, in the same way as you do all other things in Kubernetes with the same um, declarative way of, uh, of, of writing your, your deployments, your, your services, you, you, you um, control the, the, the operator, the expert in, in the same way, which makes it um, a, a, a common pattern to do. Um, and then that is something that, um, that makes it also easier to, to switch from one task to the other task when you operate and manage a, a, a uh, large scale of, of environments. Cool, and let's, oh, I, sorry, go on. Uh, yeah, one point I wanted to add, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the downside as well. It's, it's not like um, it's an easy thing to do as well. Um, so there is a decent learning curve, I would say initially, but when, when, you, when you get past that, Things become okay, uh, but but there are some things which are not straightforward. For example, uh, your your uh, versioning and stuff like that. For example, let's say um, you you bring up with your first version of your custom resource, and then uh, you want to make some changes on top of it. So the migration it really depends on like what sort of changes and stuff like that. But especially when you have like a lot of clusters uh, and people are already using like one version of it, uh, the migration of the uh, one one custom resource version to another and stuff like that. Uh, it's it's doable, yes, uh, but it's not very straightforward. So sometimes you might have to sort of want to uh, take a look at like the 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 complexity of it versus the benefit uh, you get out of it. So if you just have like a handful of clusters, maybe there is a different way which might be easy for you, right? Maybe you don't need an operator. So, but in our case, like given the number of clusters we have and the number of developers, it was like a, you know straightforward choice but there are times where you definitely want to look at what benefit you get out of it versus the complexity of like managing it and then you really have to take a call so there is this downside which i wanted to mention as well. yeah i definitely appreciate that um let's look forwards now to our last theme the community eagerly awaits the readiness of cluster api let's tell us a little bit about cluster api yeah, so I think anyone that's had the privilege of managing dozens, hundreds, or thousands of Kubernetes clusters probably heard of Cluster API at this point. And uh, it's a really exciting project that's being developed, and it's coming along fairly quickly. And I think a lot of the community is, is waiting for this to be ready. Um, it's probably the closest thing we have to a possible silver bullet to handle a lot of the issues we run into now. Um, there's kind of two main points about cluster API that are, are sort of, uh, I think, kind of tell the story a little bit. Um, the first one is that it, cluster API just approaches cluster management with more of a desired state, Kubernetes focused, cattle focused sort of um, architecture, which is awesome because uh, it's worked out well for Kubernetes itself. So it seems like this would be a good fit for the cluster management side of things. Um, it's sort of unique in that way, or, or at least mostly unique. and so I think the hope there um, is that this will solve the problem um, really well. Uh, I'm sure there'll still be edge cases that are a little rough, but this will probably be their best chance at sort of getting a really good singular tool to help us out um, with this uh, cluster management issue. And I think what's interesting about it is that um, 
even though it's cluster API has progressed quite a bit, uh, <laughs> as was mentioned at this point, everyone that has to manage clusters has built all this glue and we use all these tools and we've sort of had to go through a lot of like pain and, and effort to get to the point where we're at now where things are working and scaling in the ways that we need them to. So I think one of the tricky things for cluster API is going to be it needs to get to that threshold where it's like finally good enough to make it worth our while um, to sort of like really put the time and effort into to trialing it. Um, it at least has to match all the stuff we've built so far. So it's definitely getting there. And, and a lot of people are waiting for it to, to get to that point. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I think it's probably one of the more uh, interesting things coming up in this, in this field. Cool, anyone else wants to comment on Cluster API? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add uh, from Fidelity's side, for example, um, uh, we are multi-cloud. So we, we use like clusters and different cloud providers uh, and, you know, on-prem as well. So um, this, so we today have something custom, which sort of mimics this. This uh, We have been using it for like, uh, like a couple of years and we, we can, I mean, we, we really, Think that really helped us, um, you know, scale to like whatever number of clusters we have. So we have seen uh, the, the the importance of it. Like I'll give an example. For example, um, if you are uh, creating some clusters in like uh, AWS, we have a tool called EKS Cuddles, right? So that is like very specific uh, for you know that cloud provider. But from a user standpoint, we wanted to give this uh, a, a simple, unique interface where they just go and describe in a very neutral way, that's what they like, right? So they want to describe in a, uh, in a very neutral way where we sort of process that and behind the scenes, the tool can actually work, but we don't have to expose each of those specific tools to the users, you know, straight away. So in, in that uh, in that way, I think Cluster API, putting a spec in the front, I think it's it's going to help a lot. And another, another good thing about putting a spec in the front is that is when the ecosystem sort of starts to, you know, really evolve. The moment you have a spec, you know, a lot of tools can supporting tools can you know uh, you know evolve around it. So um, yeah, I think like personally and like from a fidelity standpoint as well, I think we have been like definitely waiting for this. Yes, it will. It will um, like kind of ex ab abstract away the lower part that um, you might have to deal with, and 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 reason about Kubernetes and the 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 original base deployment in the same way as you as you reason about your application and your services and um, it makes it really a good candidate to to uh, start to treat um, your clusters as cattle as you treat your pods and applications as cattle nice okay well I definitely look forward to it I think it's something that is quite interesting and is going to make quite a big difference in the next year or two years. So um, yeah, I think that wraps up our themes for today. So last question, um, I'd just love to hear a line or two from each of you about how you found the process of creating this radar. Was it something that you were surprised by, you found interesting? Um, Federico, do you want to start? Yeah, um, it was very interesting. Um, you never know how this is done. And um, rather than just watching a making of or the behind the scenes documentary of the tech writer, um, being part of this gives you the first uh, hand experience. Um, I enjoyed very much the, the, the conversations that we had um, around the, the entire radar. Uh, as you mentioned, this was a couple of weeks uh, process it's not just this webinar and it's not just the um the um inquiry that we send out it's um preparing it discussing the the the, the topic and then combining the results together which gives you the possibility to just like look over the fence look over your own uh fans that uh, you're normally uh, busy in your day-to-day -day stuff and see what is out there so i i can uh really recommend it to, to, to everyone um, that uh, might be invited at some point to, to, to say yes. It's, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I'll just add, it was fun for me as well. And I think it's fascinating um, 
especially uh, on certain topics to see what your peers are doing, right? Um, it kind of allows you to, to gauge if um, you have a chance to course correct or, or improve upon things. Um, so it, it for me, it was a big learning experience. Um, so yeah, it was really fun. <laughs> Yeah, completely agree with that. Um, the especially with the topic we chose, it was really uh, reassuring just to hear that you know you that this this is complicated, and then you get to see the perspectives of all the other companies tackling this issue. And it it was very much sort of uh, it helps you keep a long term sort of mindset about things while also sort of approaching the short term, like what are we doing day to day? Uh, what's the next best step? Um, and yeah, the, the amount of perspectives we've had from our conversations uh, have really opened up my eyes quite a bit. And yeah, I think it's been an incredible uh, opportunity. And I think it's great that we get to share sort of all of these conversations in the form of the radar itself. Cool, Raja, you wanna finish yourself? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely found it interesting. Um, so I think I think I personally believe in like uh, you know creating creating tech radars. Uh, I think it's super useful, especially. Um, I, th I think Neeraj mentioned about course corrections. So in, in our experience, at uh, at least over a period of last two two and a half years, at, at several points we have done course corrections, and uh, most of the time when we did that, it was uh, usually when we we sort of spoke to another uh, we into a conference or spoke to another set of companies through some other uh, you know events or something like that so uh, i think in that aspect um, i really found it interesting and I, I personally believe this is going to be very very useful for many many teams out there awesome um well i actually really enjoyed it as well so i want to say thank you to all of you to niraj raja and gabe and federico and simone who's not uh, on this webinar today um, for your time, I really appreciate it. I feel like I learned a lot from each of you as well. So thank you very much. Um, just as a reminder to finish us off, you can go back to look at previous radars at radar.cncf.io. You can also look in a little bit more detail about the different kinds of um, votes and the different kinds of companies that submitted answers to this radar. We'd love for you as well to get involved. So if you want to have a say about what the next topic is, you can go to cncf.io slash tech radar. This is just a GitHub issue where people have been posting what kind of topics they're interested in hearing about from the community and you can kind of upvote and downvote things. Um, we would love for you to come and be part of one of these future radars, be part of the team, and you can find out more about that at cncf.io slash end user. And then lastly, I'm always trying to find ways to make these radars more interesting, more relevant and more understandable. So if you have feedback, then just send that to info at cncf.io. Thank you very much. And thank you once again to all of the radar team who joined and contributed to this today. And that is all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.